All right, Charlie. Charlie, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I'm from New York City, and I grew up in Astoria, Queens, in Long Island, New York. And tell me about your uh, family growing up. I had a few really good years. Uh, my uh, focus came in about 1968. I was three years old, and my parents got me a puppy German Shepherd who we named Ringo. And my dad had a really cool convertible. It's an Impala. And uh, we had some good times growing up in Queens, and we headed out to uh, Woodstock in 1969. Uh, we didn't have tickets, and my parents didn't intend on getting in, but they just wanted to be part of the atmosphere of the festival. And we picked up a really cool hitchhiker along the way. His name was Gary. And back then, hitchhikers uh, had his pots and pans hanging from his Daniel Boone-type jacket, water bottles, and it was a really good time. My life took a sudden change after that. In 1969, my friend Kenny was the first reported death in New York City of a child overdosing on methadone. He had drank his uncle's methadone that was in the refrigerator thinking it was juice, and his brain swelled and he went to sleep and never woke up. And after that, my life started to change. I started to realize the happy-go-lucky inside me felt as though you could get hurt in your own apartment building. My parents also changed, their relationship changed after that because we moved to Long Island and my dad got a home out there and happiness should have been the story, but it wasn't. My mother and father started really having volatile fights and uh, there was drinking involved and my dad would break up the house. And all of this really robbed me of kind of growing up and feeling the way I should have felt prior to Kenny overdosing and my family fights. So from there, things never got any nicer. Um, my father, who was a very violent man, I didn't know much about him, even though he was in my life. He started to do crazy things like I wouldn't go in the pool that he had put up and it frustrated him. And he went around with an old edger like they had back in the 70s and went around the side of the pool and hatcheted the liner and all the water came out of the pool. 15,000 gallons of water blew out the backyard. And my dog was tied to a cinder block, Ringo, and he went down the driveway with the water. He survived and um, it just, it just really was a horrible time growing up. You know, my father never really even gave us a heads up as to where his anger came from. And as time would go on, he was just brutal to live with. He was very hard on my mother. And my mother was a girl that grew up without a mother and father. Her parents both had died, so she didn't know what a childhood was. And then she wound up marrying my father. The earliest memory I have of being thrown out of my house was I was eight years old. My mother knew my father would go crazy, so she put my little denim jacket on me, and she told me to get out. And I got out of the house with no money and no food, and I walked all the ways to Roosevelt Field out in Long Island. That's where Charles Lindbergh took off. And I spent the evening in Roosevelt Field, but I got tired and walked home, and the police were waiting for me. And it was my first interaction with the police. And they were like big brothers to me. They hugged me. And they told me back then, somebody could ask you for a dime, and if you don't have it, they could beat you up. And if you do have it, they could take more money from you. So from there, my father, who was in the concrete business, and he was in the union trucking business, wound up moving to another part of Long Island, uh, which the home was bigger, and we thought maybe it would be a change in things. But it simply wasn't. We grew up in uh, Merrick from there, and although there was a bigger house and more money, I started to get thrown out like a dash, dish rag all the time. I got thrown out again when I was 12 years old. Um, and it was horrible. No money, no food, and I was sleeping in the parking lot of an elementary school over the summer. And they had tunnels back then the kids used to play in, and I slept in the tunnel. As a little kid at 12 years old, I figured if I slept in the middle of the tunnel, that if somebody came in from one end to the other end, I could leave. And the way I would eat was, the police department would come at nighttime, and the cars would go driver to driver with the windows meeting each other, and they would have their conversation. And if they got a call, they would throw their food out the window. 
And I would go behind and scurry the food and pick it up and get whatever I could. And then I'd go to the supermarket in the morning and get the loaves of bread and break the bread off. And I never, ever felt I was living. I was always in survival mode, and that went on when I was 12, and it went on when I was 13. And I finally would leave my house at 17 years old. I couldn't take it anymore. And my life took a direction that I never intended it to. I wanted to have this life that I was happy, joyous, and free. And at 17, I was already out of my parents' house working at the nightclubs. And I was bouncing at the bars. And I picked up an addiction because I started to drink and I started to use pills. And before I knew it, I was addicted. I had back problems that created some of the problems. But when I took that first drug, my life had changed because I went from being in survival mode to feeling confident, to feeling as though I was okay. And I don't even think about my childhood as being a childhood. It was just an obstacle course of trying to survive. Now through all this, I never really ventured into my father's life. All I knew is that he worked for a concrete company. He was involved with it. He was involved in a union trucking. So from there, I wound up heading out to where my father's concrete plant was, and that was in an infamous part of Brooklyn, East New York. The 75th Precinct patrols that area, and drugs are rampant out there. And I picked that place to go because I had known it from my father's days of me growing up there, uh, going to work with him from time to time, and I knew the drugs were there. And I wound up at 22 years old addicted to drugs, addicted to heroin. I was sniffing heroin. I was popping all kinds of pills. I was living my life in a way that I couldn't even believe it, like a third person. I was like outside myself and I couldn't believe this was going on, but it was. And there was a lot of pain going on at that time. And I've always really kind of been an outlier. I've kind of always hung out with myself. And through my time in East New York, I wound up on the drug that I couldn't believe killed my friend. I wound up drinking methadone because I found as though in between highs it could keep me going. And I wound up addicted to that. I wound up addicted to pills. I wound up addicted to dope. And my life was really going down the drain and I needed an intervention. I had tried a few detoxes, but they didn't work. I simply could not understand how to get out of this addiction. What happened was addiction takes a life of its own. I think early on you do the drugs and you kind of say, wow, I did the drug, it's no big deal. Then you do some more. Then you try to walk away from the drug and the drug kind of grabs you from the collar and says, uh-uh, you're not leaving me. We got a relationship. It's me and you, buddy. It's me and you. It's a cozy relationship. The drugs talk to you. They make you believe that everything's gonna be okay. They're the best confidence man in the world. And here I am. I come from an abusive house. I'm abusing myself and I'm hooked on dope. But I have a vision that I'm gonna get out of this one day, but rehabs, detoxes are not working. I keep on trying them. As my life is going on in this descent, I've met people, good, bad, and different. I met a cop one time in my grade school that wound up becoming a really cool guy. He wound up going on and moving up in the police department, the New York City Police Department. And he would give me some direction at some time that I'd come back to. But the problem with drugs is that this happens. You think you can manage it, and it wants to be fed. And there's times when it gives you a reprieve to make you think, hey, I got this. One of those times was I got a soda delivery route. So happened to be right in East New York. I was delivering cheap soda in the worst parts of neighborhoods that you wouldn't want to be found dead in. 
And inside this soda delivery route, I found someone that wanted to get rid of a dog. And I showed interest in the dog. I could have got the dog for nothing, but once I showed interest, they wanted $70. And I bought the dog. And I didn't know how much of a pivotal change this dog would have in my life, that I'm still talking about it now. 1988 is a long time ago. I put this dog in my truck and we deliver soda together every day until the drugs finally take me out. I can't put gasoline in my truck anymore. I can't work anymore. I'm disabled from the drugs. All I want to do is drugs. I'm living in my apartment in Long Island with a dog. No money, no food. And I finally get to a point in my life where my mind is so clouded from the drugs. Prior, when I had some drugs in me, I could ask someone for food, or I could con my way into getting something or taking a loaf of bread. I got so disabled from the drugs that I had no way of providing food for me or my dog. It got down to one bo bottle of salad dressing in my house. That was all that was left. I would take a squirt, I'd give my dog a squirt, and I'm living this life of total, total degradation. I go from 200 and some odd pounds to 167. But my mother decides to send my father looking for me, which is a very odd act in its own, because that's something my father would never do. He came, he knocked on the door. I thought the police were at the door. Ba, 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 ba. I go to the front door, and it's my father. And my father was built like an MMA fighter, about 175 pounds, and this guy could fight. And he was in my face. And he says, look at you. What have you done with your life? And I ran away from him. And I ran across a four-lane highway to get away from him. And my dog followed me. And my dog got hit by two cars. Boom, I turn around. The dog gets up. Boom, gets hit again. I turn around. My father runs into the highway. I run into the highway. My dog, I thought, was dead. My father takes his car and he spins it around and puts it on the highway. Two guys that can never get along put my dog in the car. And we took him to an emergency vet, and he lived. He lived, but I was over a barrel. My parents said, you got no money. We don't care about your life, but you're not going to take this dog down with you. So they showed some humanness, and they took my dog. And from there, I had no place, nothing to do, and I got on the train just to kind of clear my head. And what was going to happen here was I was going to meet that cop that I met in high school. And he would see me on this Jamaica platform. And he'd look at me. And he knew I was killing myself with the drugs. And he gave me a look that I had to think to myself, this is not going good. But I still wanted to do drugs. I still wanted to go back to East New York. I still wanted to numb myself out with these drugs. And what happened was this peaceful looking guy named Michael, there would be a turning point in my life. He would appear and he'd look at me and I'd look at him and I'd say to myself, boy, that's a really peaceful looking guy. And he'd come over to me and he'd introduce himself. And he told me that he was living in a refrigerator box in the Bronx, that he too was addicted. And he found a spiritual reprieve in a monastery in upstate New York called Graymore. And I said to him, do you usually tell people this? He says, no, but you look hurting. You look like you're really hurting. I said to him in a quick rundown of my life, I said, detox is not working. Nothing's working. I said, do I look bad? He says, you got tombstones in your eyes. I said, will I live? He says, if you don't get this arrested, this addiction, you won't make it. But I still didn't take that and the cop that I knew from high school as enough. I got on the train and I rode the train to try to figure out what I was going to do with my life, that my dog is gone. My life is gone. 
I wasn't paying my rent in my apartment. I was being evicted. I had no transportation. I would decide to get off this train in the middle of the night and get off at East New York and start walking around. And I would be on a search for drugs, which was by itself insane. I come across a burnt out building and there's men with a 50 gallon drum keeping warm and shooting up drugs. And what happened was I felt a push to go towards them, to ask them if I could use drugs with them. A chanting in me, go ask if you could join them. Go ask if you could join them. Now I hadn't shot up drugs. I was drinking methadone, popping pills and sniffing dope. I had this desire to destroy myself and I couldn't stop it. I had no willpower. But I thought about that guy, Michael, on the train station. I thought about his belief with the spiritual. And I believed because he believed. And I started chanting, God help me, God help me, God help me. All of a sudden, it gave me strength. It gave me power. It made the stop forward motion stop. And I yelled out, God help me. And from there, the guys that were doing drugs by the 50 gallon drum, they look up. They were startled. And I turned around. And I'm not a runner. I ran as hard as I could, as long as I could. And I finally get to a fire station with the door open. The FDNY had a man, a fireman. He was doing something with the truck. And I run in. And I said, I need help. He goes, what happened? Where's the emergency? I said, you're looking at it. It's me. He says, what's wrong? I said, I need water. I need water. I need to know that I'm OK. Said, no, here's some water. I washed my face. I looked at my face in the, in, in the mirror. I couldn't believe what had happened to me. But I was awake. I was awake. I realized that I was awake, and I did not want to continue this lifestyle. So I had no footwear. I had no footwear on my feet. Because prior to this, I was walking around those cheap flip-flops, the kind you get from a hospital if you're, if you're being intake, or the kind that you get at a dollar store. I had no foot, it was barefoot. He gave me some sneakers, he gave me a shirt. And I got some money to get to the Jamaica train station where I would call my father. And I called my father at six o'clock in the morning. And he answered the phone like he normally would. Hello? I said, Dad, I need help. Where are you? I said, I'm at the Jamaica train station. He says to me, what are you doing there? I said, I need a ride, Dad. He goes, it's Friday. I got to work today. Dad, can you give me a ride after work? I can. He says, where are you going? I said, I got to go up to Graymore. He goes, Graymore? I go, you know the place? He goes, yeah, it's been around forever. He goes, that's for people that are at the end of their rope. I said, well, I'm at the end of my rope. He says, the... I said, it's perfect. I need to be there. He says, look, I don't know why you want to go there, but I'll give you my word. I'll get off of work and pick you up, stay in front of the Jamaica's train station, don't leave. Back then, there was no cell phones. So I stayed at the Jamaica train station. He didn't get there till about almost 7, and he picks me up. There was a different energy flowing between me and my father. My father, who I'll get into in a second, why we can never get along. I get in this car, and there's tension at first, but there's a different energy, and he says to me, son, what's going on? I said, dad, you'll no never understand what happened. I said, I almost died in Brooklyn tonight. How's, our, how's my dog? And that kind of gave him a good mood. He goes, you know, I don't know what that dog is made of, but the dog is doing okay. The dog is doing okay. I said, great, Dad. And we drove up to Graymore. And as luck would have it, it was a rainy night. And my father, who liked Frank Sinatra, Pavarotti, he had cassettes of the, of the time, Hootie and the Blowfish. Aaron Neville was playing. And two guys, like I talked earlier in this, that could never get along, we rode in peace till I got up to Graymore. Went to Graymore. My father 
showed me the first emotion in his whole life towards me. He got a little teary-eyed. He goes, son, you sure you want to do this? I said, I have to. So what occurred was, I went to Graymore, and I got this, what they call a spiritual awakening. I was able to understand what had happened. I had rode down the road of addiction. But addiction is cunning. After about two weeks putting some weight on, I told the monastery that I was ready to go home. They said, oh, you are? They said, you're homeless. You have no home. Your father said you don't have a home. You have no place to go. We're providing a home for you. We're providing meals for you. We're helping you. And I started to cry. I spent some time at the monastery. I would go on to go to rehab for a short period after that, and this time it worked. And I would get clean off of drugs and alcohol and stay that way. Then, at some point, after getting clean and sober, the one suggestion they tell you is in the first year of sobriety, don't get in a relationship. I got in a relationship. I met a girl outside the rehab, and it changed my life. The girl happened to have family in Nebraska. I got serious with the girl. After about a week, I got a U-Haul truck and we moved in. No, we got, I got serious and we wound up starting a life together. The life that started in New York wound up in Nebraska. So here I'm in this new relationship. I wind up getting married. The only place that would hire me, of all places, was the Department of Corrections. So here I am with this past, but I'm clean. They run my record, and although I had some jam-ups, nothing was substantial that didn't get dismissed or move on. Because again, it's New York, maybe if it was Missouri or other places, they would have given me a record. And I get a job for the Department of Corrections. And I start to live my life as if nothing would have happened. The problem with this was, wherever you take yourself, if you're wounded, you're gonna feel your feelings. Probably the last place I needed to work is the Department of Corrections. So I went from the streets of New York, the drugs, to a monastery, and within a year's time, I graduate the academy for the Department of Corrections, and I'm in between death row inmates and their visitors. I have serial killers, their families, visiting them, and in Nebraska, it's different than other states. Nebraska, although the prison system is a pretty intense prison system and does make the news a lot for overcrowding and a lot of violence, they believe visits should be with no glass. So I did the visits. And a lot of things occurred with those visits. A lot of hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I went from one extreme to the other extreme. And I would be there right down to the wire with these death row inmates. And I asked them questions. There's always been a question asking guy. Hey, if you had your life to do again, what would you do different? They all said, life takes care of itself. If I didn't in introduce myself into a situation or I didn't use anger or drugs or alcohol, I would have not been here. But I had to have my desired result. I had to take justice in my own hands. You know, unlike what people hear in the movies, prison's a lot different. Not everybody is Charlie Manson. Not everybody is in there for being a serial killer, although the death row inmates usually are people that have gone to that extreme. But a lot have killed one person. A lot have had a bad day where they took out their aggression, and now they got the death penalty. The death penalty is not given to everyone, and there are situations where somebody may have murdered three people and don't get the death penalty, and somebody murders one person and gets the death penalty. I'm here now hearing all this. But I'm clean and sober now, and I'm living my life. And from this position, I'm going to learn one more valuable lesson that is going to put me on the new path that I've been on. Today is my 24th year of continuous sobriety. In 1998, working death row, 
I decided that alcohol wasn't a drug, and I decided to drink. It was a short relapse. I quickly got paranoid from alcohol. The brain didn't know what it was being anesthetized by. All it knew was being numbed, and then it'd come to again. Then I'd get numbed, and come to. Paranoia, night sweats, everything the drugs did, the alcohol did. So what occurred was, in 1998, I was working in the Department of Corrections, and paranoia hit me. I got spooked. I didn't know where I was. I look around, and there's all these cops with uniforms on. I'm like, where the fuck am I? How did I get here? Now, here's the crazy part. I was sober. I hadn't drank that day. I drank the night before. But paranoia, fear set in. I look down, and I'm wearing a badge. I'm part of the system. I don't know how I got into this. I leave that day. I have a drink to calm my nerves. And that will be the last drink that I ever have. Now, here is what a lot of addicts and alcoholics say is you can't project the future. I made a decision right then and there that drugs and alcohol are no part of my life. My coworkers knew I was off. I hadn't gotten written up yet. It was coming. But what's different? I had a problem with alcohol. I had coworkers that walked out in the parking lot, went home and shot themselves in the head. I had coworkers that drank themselves to death. I had a form of what I was seeing. I get sober, and within 30 days, my life changes. I wind up moving up in the Department of Corrections. I wind up becoming a caseworker. I wind up getting other promotions. I wind up becoming the first correctional officer in uniform to testify as a character witness for a death row inmate. Did I ask to do that? No. But the inmate had said to himself that he's following the rules, that he's following the mission statement, that he's doing everything he's supposed to do, and he wants to be resentenced. I, from that point on, went and told the truth with the inmate. Not that I told, didn't tell the truth prior to that, but I told them exactly what they wanted to hear, which was the truth. His defense attorney asked me, the prosecutor asked me, and that was that. I moved through corrections. About the 10-year point, I had the keys to the whole institution at the Nebraska Penitentiary. And I wind up saying to myself, this isn't my future. I don't want this. This is not what I want to do with my life. When I decided to leave corrections, they were shocked. I only had two supervisors, the associate warden and the warden. The warden and the associate warden were shocked that I was leaving because I had overcome so much. I was clean and sober and really living a good life. I started a trash business somewhere along the line towards my eighth or ninth year in corrections. It had taken off. I felt as though that I missed a lot of things in my childhood. This trash business really grew and grew and grew. And I quickly found that even money could not fix the hole inside me. Whatever I thought was going to fix me, the cars, the right home, the girlfriend, it didn't. And I'm going to take you to a further point in my life. In 2012, I was at my desk in the trash business. And we've gone from 1988 through the 90s, through the new millennial. I left corrections. I turned in my notice the Wednesday after 9-11. That was the changing point in my life. I said, nope, I'm going to stick with my business. I'm going to stick with my goals. And I did it. On August 12th, August 13, 2012, I, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk in Nebraska, and I look at the New York Daily News. And the headlines will change my life. It'll give me the life that I have right today. It'll say, Pitbull shot and killed. Homeless man's pit bull shot and killed. Now, I didn't know why that headline meant so much to me. It would take years till I really knew what that meant. You see, I really cleaned myself up. I got myself fit. I really removed myself from any past of really hanging out in East New York, having the childhood I had, 
And I had moved past all that. I was a businessman now. I was sitting at my desk. But when that dog got shot, something in my stomach just flipped upside down. I couldn't handle it. I called in anybody I could in my office. I called the vice president of the company. I had them look at the video that the Daily News had put up. He said, Charlie, it's a sad story. The homeless man had a seizure. And they shot his dog because they wanted to offer help to the dog, and the dog was circling the man. I couldn't accept that. For some reason, here's what I believed in my life. I believed, because I've always been in survival mode, if you put the drugs in my hand, as I put the money in your hand, we're square. If I deliver a dumpster, if my company delivers a dumpster, and you put a check or cash in my driver's hand, we're good. I had no faith. But for some reason, that day, I had a tremendous amount of faith. And I believed that that dog had lived. And I called the city of New York. And I didn't lie. And I called them from my business line. And they saw that it was a recycling trash business. And I called up and asked for the admin of the dog shelter that handled all of New York City's dog problems. And I got a lady, Renee, on the phone who said to me after we talked about recycling and trash, and I warmed her up a little bit, the dog is actually still alive. The dog will probably die, but the public can handle a dog that is dead rather than one that's lingering. And that's why they put that out. I had purpose for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life, I decided to put all my energy into something other than be in survival mode. Fear went away. I gotta save this dog's life. I gotta find this dog. Now, the story went global because the Daily News, the New York City Police said, dog is dead, dog is dead. I started a Facebook page, Star of the New York Pit Bull. That was the only way I knew how to communicate with people. And I put my thoughts of this dog to the public. And it took a lightning speed change. The public rallied behind me. And this dog, the Daily News, had to go from dog is dead the dog is making a lightning speed recovery. The dog is in Wikipedia, star of the dog. The dog is global. They everywhere put the dog, Nebraska man, this, that. So the city of New York kind of had a black eye that the dog was dead, then came back alive, and they stuck the dog in Philadelphia under an assumed name. And all this stuff occurred. And while this was going on, and I was building a big audience, I decided that there would be no other goal in my life but to find this dog and to give this dog a home. And I walked away from the trash business and I walked away from everything that had me connected that was about me surviving, about me paying bills, about this, about that. I was on a quest, and I didn't know it at the time, to reclaim my life and to get a childhood again. I had a California filmmaker say to me, Charlie, I've read all these headlines, man. You don't get it. The reason why you have done this is because that homeless man and that dog was you. That was you on the ground. That was you that nobody cared about. That was you that was addicted. That was you, you, you. And that dog, that was your dog that you couldn't give a good home with because the addiction robbed you of that. This dog would be different. I rescued that dog with all the fervor I had. They put the dog in Philadelphia. They gave her a new name. They did all this. I wind up eventually convincing the city of New York to make me the lawful owner of this dog. And I get this dog. And me and this dog do some really wonderful things for others. We get involved in the Alzheimer's Association. We do walks. We do cancer walks. We start a, a, a dog rescue and rescue dogs. And all this stuff comes about. And at some point in 2018, several years, I, the dog, I wound up giving a home to the dog in 2013. She was shot in 2012. I decided to write a book about this story. And I went to newspapers.com and punched in my name, my father's name and my last name to see if I can give any background about my father that I didn't know much about. And to my complete, I wouldn't believe what I would see. 
I thought maybe, you know, this or that. My father is involved with a man that I believed was my godfather, Joseph Imbruglia, who's involved in a French connection, who the FBI is looking for in 1980 for a hundred million dollar synthetic heroin ring, who in 1956 sticks up a cabaret with my dad. And the cops show up, a New York City police, and they put a gun in his stomach, and the gun misfires. If that gun didn't misfire, I'd never be here. And my father goes away. And now the picture gets clear. He's a dangerous man. This guy never had bedside manner. He went away at 24 years old to Dannemora, Clinton, one of the worst prisons. This man that I didn't know had this crazy, crazy background. So I continue writing my book. And in 2018, which I was writing it, I go back up to Graymore, 25 years after I had left with my dog Star. They said, you can come under one stipulation. You must bring this miracle dog. We've read about her. And imagine going back to the place that saved my life with my dog. And not only did they want her there, they cherished her there. She ate off the same plates as we did. We talked to the board of directors, and I told them about my life since I had gone there. We had met the staff, we had met the residents, and I told them my story, how I had overcome addiction and my new life. Well, I had this information about my father. And when I went to the monastery, they said to me that I had to forgive him. He didn't do the best he could, but he's a human. You've been forgiven. It took me a few days to compose myself when I got back in 2018. I knew I had to tell him. If it wasn't for him, I, got, I wouldn't have ever got up to that Graymore in the first place. And he did answer my call. My mother was upset, and she text messaged me that he unexpectedly went to the hospital because of heat exhaustion. And they mistakenly gave him a deadly dose of fentanyl, and he had died. So I spent a lot of time being angry at him. And then when I get the solution, he's now gone. He's gone. I got to continue my life. I go forward. I continue to go forward with my dog. I wind up meeting that police officer that many years earlier that looked at me at that train station and I get friendly with him again and he becomes a source of strength and 2019 happens and 2020 as we know with the pandemic 2020 it's a blur clean and sober 2021 happens and my dog gets sick star gets sick and I bring it to the vet and they don't think anything's major wrong with her but she's got some edema she's got some swelling they don't know they aspirate her lump it's not cancer then they think it might be cancer and she's laying down on the couch and won't get up and I'm getting everybody telling me it's her time it's time for her to go well, I don't want to make that decision, but it looks like I may have to. She gets off the couch. She gets off the couch. Like nothing happened. This dog that came back from the dead, that is now off the couch, what do I do with her? What do I do? I decide to take her back where her life started. She grew up on the streets of the lower, the, not the lower east side, the east village. I bring her back to the east village. People see her. Hey, Star, I know her. I see her on Facebook. We have a tremendous day because I'm around people. You know, the people that make me feel comfortable are the people that have something called time. Who has time in America? It's people that don't have a, an agenda. Homeless people 
travelers, people that aren't bought into the success quota, like I thought, like I thought I was going to get happy, successful, get a home. I didn't even recognize the home I was in. It was sterile. That didn't make me happy. I went to the East Village. It made me happy with my dog. And we enjoyed that day. And we enjoyed going to Freedom Tower. And I got all these photos. I had a few, maybe it was a month of good life with her. And then on February 19th, 2021, with my fiance next to me, I said, you know what? I'm going to give Star a bath. I'm going to give her a bath. She's health is going back and forth, but she's doing okay today. And I pick her up to give her a bath, to bring her to the bathtub. And she takes in about three deep breaths. I put her down. And she's dead. This dog that gave me a, a childhood, this dog that gave me everything, gave me purpose, was just gone. There was no, hey, listen, you're at the vet, you might have another day or two. She was just gone. She died. And I, couldn't, I couldn't even believe she, she was just dead, gone. I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do with myself. There is a place you could be in when you don't use drugs and alcohol. There's a place you could be in when you don't do behaviors that are destructive. There's a place you can be in when you don't decide to overeat anymore. It's called feeling. And I wasn't given a lot of emotional muscle from the factory. And now I was feeling like I never felt before and I wanted the pain to stop. I could not believe this beautiful dog just left the planet. I couldn't believe it. So she was gone. And I asked my fiance, I said, please, take a picture of me with this dog. Take a picture. I didn't even have a chance to take one last picture. She goes, honey, she looks distorted from whatever happened to her, whether she had a heart attack, or whether she had an aneurysm. I said, no, I'm going to the living room. I'm going to take a picture with my dog. And I took the dog probably 20 minutes after she passed away, and I sat on the couch. And air came out of her lungs, or something happened. And a smile came to her face. And I got that picture. That's my picture. She might be a public dog. She might be known all over the world. But that is my dog. That is my dog. And I had been through all these situations in this life. I had been through taking the last cup of coffee from a death row inmate. I had been through situations with death row inmates telling me stuff that no human should ever hear. And we are the unsung heroes in law enforcement that, that work in corrections. There's stuff that happens to us and we see stuff that no human soul should ever see. Because there's no privacy in prison. And I take this picture and I decide that I don't know what to do. But I remember the filmmaker that told me that I was that homeless man in this story and I was that, that dog was my dog. And although People always ask, what happened to the homeless man? Him, like me, was almost exactly like a mirror. He decided to take care of his addiction to seizures. He couldn't handle the dog. So he signed the dog over to the city of New York, just like I signed my dog over to my parents. I'd have to sign it. They took it. So what happens now is I think about what that filmmaker, Charlie, makes something good out of something bad. Charlie, you got to make something good out of something bad. And I didn't think there'd be a life after Star. The thought of me giving an interview, the thought of me going and talking to anybody after this, it'd be very selfish. There are people that are listening to this that think their life might be over. They think they've made the biggest mess of their lives and there's no hope. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope when we stop using. There is hope when we get a solution. And for me, the ability that people take their time and listen and give me an opportunity to tell my story. I know there's no shortage of people that have had a bad childhood. I know there's no shortage of people that want to talk about themselves. But for me, it's been a lifesaver to be able to talk about my journey with Star and talk about this incredible dog. I lived 
in reverse. I should have grew up and matured and got emotional muscle and went on to have a life. No, I had a dog that gave me a childhood that taught me about human beings and relationships. See, she was more of a human being than she was a dog. Taught me that I'm a human being, not a human doing. Taught me that although I'm a citizen of the United States, I'm really a citizen of the world. This dog taught me that my friends are global. That when I hear the news, because it doesn't happen from California to Maine, doesn't mean it didn't happen, I care all over. And somebody like myself, I can't harbor resentments. It's a death of me because I need sunlight. And I've been given a pass for a second chance. And I believe everybody deserves a second chance. Beautiful talk, Charlie. Charlie, thank you.